I know it's uh, a little past six and people are still um, filing in, but I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I did post a link to uh, live transcriptions in case anyone needs those. Um, because I know, um, well, I assume some folks uh, native languages in English and maybe the transcriptions will help. Uh, it's not perfect. If you click on the link, a window will open up and there'll be transcriptions. It is an AI. Uh, so it's not entirely perfect, but it's a good start. And then I also have a link to the slide deck, um, a slightly different version that I gave in Triple Camp Atlanta, because there's some links and, you know, if anyone wants to view it later, just for reference and that sort of thing. Uh, so today I'm going to give a version of the first time contributor workshop that we give at DrupalCon, um, but slightly different because I teach it at the regional and local level. Um, so I add a little bit more things about what you can do in the issue queue and outside of the issue queue that aren't code contributions. Um, so I will move some windows around and what's going to happen is I'm going to give like a short presentation on things and then we'll uh, I'll change the way my screen is configured and I'll do a demo of a couple of things as well. I would have loved to present how to do the pull request, um, the new pull request workflow, but it's not quite ready for collaboration. And as uh, for new contributors, I don't want to muddle things up. So I'm just going to stick with patching today uh, because patching isn't going to go away anytime soon. And even with the pull request workflow, folks are still using um, patches. So um, let's get started. Uh, my name is Amy June. I live outside of the San Francisco Bay Area in California in the United States. I am a QA engineer at Canopy Studios, um, but my main job is open source community ambassador. So I just spend my day sort of helping everyone out and contributing back to Drupal, mostly in the form of mentoring. Uh, I work with the community working group. Um, when you think of the community working group, you might think conflict resolution, but I'm on uh, the community health team. And this is a great way to give back to Drupal too. We're always looking for new members for the community working group. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're working on Drupal.org infrastructure and Slack infrastructure on how we can um, have good moderating tools to promote collaboration and easy workflow when uh, language gets in the way. So if you're interested in working on the community health team, let me know and I can um, I can get you some more information. And you know who's here today? Anyone can be here for this presentation because absolutely everyone can give back to Drupal. You know, all skill levels, all job roles. All you really need to do is have that passion for moving the project forward. And, and I'm going to say this many times today. There are so many ways to give back besides code. Uh, so going through the agenda, I'm going to talk about why we contribute benefits of con contributions, a few of the different types of contributions, um, kind of give you a kickstart on how to contribute. And then we'll look at some tooling and documentation, but not that much. Uh, and then we'll do sort of a broader look at the issue queue and then demo the patching process. We contribute for many different reasons. Um, and again, you can still contribute without ever having to make a patch. Some of our most prolific contributors are non-code contributors. And um, a lot of times this happens like for the first time at a contribution day. And a contribution day, what they used to call sprints, but it's really a gathering to do focused work on a project or issue. Um, and why do we contribute? Well, one reason is if you depend on open source, then open source depends on you. Your contributions are really valued. Um, it takes everyone's voice to learn to, to know how our software is used. So the more people who contribute from all different skill levels and all different um, user roles, the better our software becomes. And then, of course, Giving back to Drupal get, gives back to you, especially if you use the software. The more feature requests we make, the more uh, the more bugs we fix, um, even the more more we market. You know, Drupal becomes a, a known product. You know, it has that sense of vitality. And then contributing makes you feel 
like a part of the community. Um, you know, you go to camps and you go to conferences and there's that content delivery part. And a lot of times like today, you know, in the Netherlands, we have this contribution day. It adds to another thing that you can do when you're with your community and you meet new people. And I like to talk about why agencies should give back because I'm very fortunate that I work for an agency that pays me for my time and I give back. So I get paid to give back. But I'm, I say, if you want to give back, be an advocate for yourself, you know, and, and talk to your, to your company owners about the benefits of them giving back as well. Because companies who consume Drupal, you know, people who use Drupal as a free open source project should certainly give back. They should appreciate the value of helping others. And then the tech industry using and contributing to open source software is seen as a good corporate citizenship. And it's really part of a firm's social responsibility. Not only that, it's fun and rewarding to work with, you know, the smartest, innovative people in the Drupal community. Um, and this really reflects um, when potential employees and partners view an agency's profile, you know, if they can use that as sort of, of a recruiting page, you know, I would go to a company and look at their profile and see how important giving back is. And some of the benefits of contributing, you know, it's not just about feeling good, you know, but that is certainly a good part of it because think about it, you know, Drupal runs 3% of the websites in the world, you know, how many hundreds of thousands, how many millions of websites are you influencing, you know, by contributing back to Drupal? Um, it builds your resume. Uh, you know, like I said, not only does it make you feel good, but you move that project closer to perfection, you know, developers and others who give back to the community build a sort of rep uh, reputation, like a, like street cred. And you know that they're probably okay with others reviewing their code and can accept feedback because, you know, creating issues and forks parallels working on tickets and creating branches like we do in our agency or, or, or main workflow. And contributing back to open source shows developers or, or shows people and the coworkers that the developer is willing and able to work on a team. Um, it enables folks to write more stable code, which follows coding standards. And I know for me, the more I contribute, the more I learn because um, I'm not a coder necessarily. I mean, I do know some code, but that's not really something I pursue, you know, but each time I look at an issue and each time I work on something, I learn a little bit more. And so I'm so looking at my skill level in code now from three years ago, I don't actively study it. All the stuff I know now comes directly from working in that issue queue. So all the different types of uh, contributions, and they can take so many forms. There's external documentation guides. You can work on translation. You can definitely share your knowledge. You can speak at camps, run boffs, um, talk at your meetups, uh, train. You can write themes and contributed modules you know maybe you're working on a project for for an agency and um, that organization that you're working for that government agency is paying you to work on a theme well and or some custom code ask them if you can give that back to the drupal project promoting the platform um, marketers, human resources, salespeople, you know, um, like I said, you don't have to know code and you can be sort of an evangelist for the platform, you know, promote it, uh, let people know the value of it. And then of course, you know, working in that issue queue. And I'm going to talk about all of these a little bit more now. So that first one, documentation, you know, internal and external documentation guides. And this is, it's a little funny for me because I started my roots in Drupal documentation and it was always, I had this wonder of, you know, everyone always says just start with contribution, but how do I contribute to documentation if I don't know what I'm doing? But I quickly learned that I was the perfect person to contribute back to documentation because I didn't know what I was doing. And if there was a gap in that documentation, I needed to fill it. And it really helps the next person. So official guides, there's uh, the official guides are governed 
um, by maintainers and they're held to a more established standard because there's an editorial process. Not everyone can contribute. You know, you kind of, you start a discussion and then the maintainers of the guide um, uh, will collaborate with folks. So there's the Drupal users guide. You know, this is written for people with not a whole lot of knowledge in the knowledge of the Drupal CMS. And it's really aimed for people who already have some experience with the current or past version, but they want to expand their knowledge or maybe update them to the to the to a current version. Uh, there's evaluator guides. This um, you need to well this guide, let's see, it you learn how to quickly create temporary um, applications for your local machine. You know, this guide really provides those deep instructions on um, how to how to use Drupal to evaluate, you know, on your machine. You know, and this application is suitable for live websites and um, it really helps uh, helps you understand what it takes to get Drupal running on your machine. And then there's the local development guide. And this is the purpose really assists with creating and installing um, Drupal on the machine. This is intended for the guide um, for the developer use. And then there's community guides. Community guides don't have that editorial process and they can be edited freely by anyone in the Drupal community. And this is a great way to give back. There's um, the Drupal guide, which is a catch-all for um, Drupal 8, 9, and later. You can find Drupal 7 and Drupal 6 versions, but they're not really currently being updated. There's developer guides. Um, this is documentation uh, about the tools and the processes and the standards that are specific to certain parts of Drupal. You know, if, if you're following these guides and, and you're doing things a little bit different, you know, you can contribute and add more details about how, how you use the softwares. And then there's API guides. And these provide the general overview of Drupal core APIs. And for those who might not know, API stands for application programming interface. And it's the part of the server that receives the requests um, and sends responses. There's various guides and guidelines on using drupal.org tools and services and i'm just going to kind of breeze through these you know there's user accounts you know these are things about user permissions instructions on how to become confirmed confirmed how to set up two-factor authentication um there's content guidelines uh there's case studies drupal planet um how to get your organization you know promoted that kind of thing marketplace guidelines this uh this tells you about how to get your company into the marketplace. Moderation and maintenance. This is about, you know, the really instructions for content moderators and um, for users that have advanced roles, like in the webmasters role or the content role. Building Drupal.org. This is documentation for people who are participating in bug fixes or developing new features. Circle CI, you know, testing the automated infrastructure. RSS feeds, um, Drupal campsite archives, APIs, GitLab integration. I want to talk a little bit about Drupal.org content. Um, you can talk. Uh, this is the this is the issue tracker to organize and moderate the non documentation part. You know, so these are book listings, case studies, front page promotions, hosting, organization profiles, Planet Drupal, uh, regionalized or localization Drupal service listings, training listings, and translations is a great way to give back to Drupal. Um, these support in, really includes like the software localization, you know, website translations, uh, simply spreading awareness of the product through word of mouth and social media. Um, there is always a need for contributors uh, for contributions and translations because some have only incomplete versions of the text and core so that the other parts of the interface show up in English. 
Uh, while others need corrections and improvements, there is no language that has a complete set of translations for all the contributed modules. So if you are multilingual um, or you have a passion, you know, for, 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 for making Drupal more available where you live, translations is a great place to, to contribute. And sharing your knowledge, you know, share something cool at a local meetup camp. When you speak and you train at a camp, you're really seen as an authority in your field. You know, you share your knowledge with others and you also build your confidence. You know, it can be really rewarding and have a sense of uh, a feeling of accomplishment. And it can definitely build your career, you know, and you can be a role model for mar marginalized and unrepresented unrepresented um, communities. You know, the more women in faces of color um, we see on attendee pages and speaker pages, the more people who will come to our camps, you know, really, um, really be mindful um, of who you are and what you can contribute back. You know, again, there's meetups, there's Drupal camps, there's DrupalCon. Um, and what can you talk about? Really, you can talk about anything. You know, I have a list here, but, but I'm not going to go through it necessarily. You know, distributed themes, modules, and guides. You can pick um, and choose a wide range of contributed modules to add functionality to your site. Um, and then the themes change the your site's appearances. So there's all kinds of add-on modules and themes known as contrib um, because they're contributed back to the community. You know, there's distributions. Uh, these provide features and functions of a specific type of site, you know, where you can do a single download containing core software and it comes along with a package of contributed modules, themes, and then perhaps some predefined configuration. You know, just to, to talk a little bit that the theme is the set of files that define the visual look um, and the module is, you know, a set of PHP or JavaScript or CSS files that extends the site features and adds functionality. You know, any custom code you work on on someone's site, you can definitely give back to Drupal. And this is why we're here now, the issue queue. So we'll do kind of an issue queue 101 right before we do a demo. So what do we do in the issue queue? All different types of things. We report issues, we update issues and triage them. We uh, write patches, we provide feedback and we test patches. You, if people don't report bugs and make notes on how to reproduce them or on ways to reproduce similar behaviors, our core maintainers and engineers have no way of knowing how the software is getting used. So all of those client facing errors and bugs are just as important as the code. Making sure the project looks good for future clients and users ensures really the future of the product, the product, you know, lots of people say, oh, well, it's just a typo. Well, if it's a typo in the UI, people evaluating our projects see that, you know, if there's messy code with, you know, not adhering to coding standards, folks are evaluating our project, you know, so all of them are worth reporting. UI errors, you know, user interface errors, documentation, accessibility, bugs, and administrative UI things are just as important too. you know, think of the, the people who are building the websites and and how they use the admin interface. So it's not just client facing, it's admin facing as well. And again, you don't have to know how to fix the issue to report it. So when we're in the issue queue, you know, and you find a bug, we just want to make sure a couple of things. One, does it already exist? You want to make sure that you're not re uh, like being redundant and you know uh, uh, creating more work for for someone if it's already on there. So you want to make sure it already exists. If it does exist, you want to look at that issue, um, the report. You know, it's kind of like a bug report. You want to update any changes. You know, you want to make sure that you you validate if you found similar findings, and then perhaps even add steps to replicate. And then you know if if you know, then adding steps to validate is important too for the next person who might want to test it. 
And patching can be daunting, you know, so in the issue queue, you know, start with triage, you know, making sure that the issue is still relevant. You know, if you're going through the issue queue and you find Drupal 6 and Drupal 5 issues and even some Drupal 7 issues, well, those might, those you might want to close because they're just adding a lot of bulk and they're probably not going to get fixed. Uh, you can tag issues. This helps folks find issues that they want to work on. And when we create an issue in a little bit, I'll show you the importance of tagging because you can search the issue queue by by what you want to work on. You know, if you're an accessibility advocate, you can search for the word advocate or I mean accessibility. If you're working at a camp, you know, sometimes camps will tag, you know, bad camp 2020 and you can find what other people are working on at the camp you're attending. You know, uh, you can test and review the code. You can open up your code editor and you can look at it. You can apply patches in your in your terminal. You can use Simply Test Me. Now, Simply Test Me is a great tool, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. It's not always working because as Drupal changes, um, the maintainers of Simply Simply Test Me are all volunteers and sometimes can't keep up with it. So I know. Today, Simply Test Me, we're not going to use, but it's a great resource for, for non coders and people who don't have local environments to test the issues as well. And then, you know, if you're up to it, you've done all these things a few times, you can test and review the code, you can apply patches, you can re roll patches. You know, there's been updates um, to, the, to the project or to the theme since the last patch has been made, so you can go in there and modify it so you know when it applies, it will apply to the current code base. And how to pick an issue, you know, this, this is sometimes the, the hardest part. Um, and there's so many to choose from. I have a, a picture up here um, where you can see that there's an advanced search function. Um, this can help you sort of uh, refine your search results. Um, and this is what pops open when you hit that button. You can see now you've got a couple of things to choose from that you didn't have before. You know, you can choose any sort of uh, issue tags. And that as you start typing, you know, it's on autocomplete. So you can find issue tags. You can um, maybe search uh, by who is working on it. You know, say you have a coworker or a friend who told you about an issue they're working on, but you can't remember the issue. You can start typing the user's uh, D.O profile name, and you can see all of those issues that they're working on. You can see who's following the issue. You know that someone at work um, is just watching the issue to make sure or um, following the updates. You know, there's all different kinds of, of, of issues and ways to uh, refine your search. But along with that, I also want to talk about things to steer clear of as a novice contributor. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through some of this a little bit more when we create an issue in a bit. Um, you kind of want to steer away from projects that aren't actively maintained as a new contributor. Um, because it can be a little bit discouraging to work on a project and then never see any results. But with saying that, sometimes other people are still using that project. And if you create a patch for something, at least it's in that issue queue and the next person who has that bug or problem can search the issue queue and there's your patch. It might never be um, rolled into the code, but that patch is there for the next person. But as a new contributor, I do say, you know, just look for things that are actively worked on. Um, perhaps steer clear of projects with a lot of open issues. Um, of course, some of the bigger projects like MetaTag or, you know, Views in D7 have a lot of open issues because they're used by a lot of people. But if it's a smaller one and you see, you know, there's a hundred issues that just aren't getting, getting dealt with, you know, that might be an indication that it's not actively maintained. And then steering clear of projects that have multiple issues being closed that say won't fix, because this can be an indication that the the module isn't really looking um, for collaboration. But we have to understand too, that it might take a couple iterations to get the code the way that the maintainers want. So if you do submit to some of these projects, try not to get down on yourself if you don't see your code um, rolled in um, in a timely manner. You know, just be happy that you're getting your code reviewed and people are looking at it, you know, because that positive attitude really goes a long way, you know, and if you show enthusiasm to learn the code base and help others and add value, others will see that and give you sort of that benefit of the doubt as a new contributor. I also recommend staying away from issues that 
one particular issue that have over 100 comments as a new contributor, and some people say 10. Um, issues that have changed status many times, you can tell that people um, are deliberating over the issue and it keeps getting passed from needs review to fix or needs review to reviewed and tested by the community and there's just a lot of banter back and forth. Um, and then issues where processes and fixes are discussed back and forth can can be confusing as a new contributor, you know, because you might not understand the scope or what folks are talking about. Um, so let's look at an issue itself. The title of the issue um, should be descriptive, yet not aggressive or accusatory. You know, you want it to be short and concise because when people search in the queue, they want to have certain keywords on there. Um, you want to make sure that you fill out the category. Is it a bug report, a feature request? Is Are you just asking for support? Um, is the, what kind of level is this? You know, what kind of priority is this? Is this just a minor, uh, minor something in the UI? You know, does the readme need some help? Are there typos? Or, you know, is it critical? Does it deproduce the white screen of death? You know, that's, that might, that helps maintainers uh, triage and decide what to work on first. It's important to note what version of the project you're working on, because it could be 3.1 um, and you haven't updated it you know, to 3.7 yet. So indicate what version of the project needs, 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 a, needs a fix. And then what component helps refine people in the search, you know, and this varies on project because the maintainers can pick what components um, are listed in the drop down. You know, it could be UI, it could be documentation, it could be code, tests, uh, sub modules. Um, making sure you uh, tag it, you know, or you don't have to tag it, but that makes it easier in the issue queue to find as well. And I went over this the first time, you know, making sure that that title is really. This is a picture of the interface in a larger scale. You can see that, you know, the category, the priority, the status, and the version are drop downs. So just keep with those drop downs. And then as far as filling in tags, that's a, a text field, but be mindful of the tags that already exist. So when you do fill out a tag, let autocomplete be your friend because the tag probably already exists. And I see a question that I want to answer real quick. How can I get a feel of what's happening with my issue? Will I get sort of product progress indication as to whether my code is reviewed? Okay, so I'll talk about this, I think, as we do the issue. But um, when you create an issue, every time that a comment is made or a status changes, you will get an email that indicates uh, uh, what status it is. Every time someone makes a comment, you'll get an email alert. And then if you haven't filed the issue yourself, you can hit the follow button and you'll get an email notification. Um, and I always tell folks too that sometimes maintainers get busy or they get a lot of comments over the weekend and you feel, if you feel like you're not getting results or you want to move it quickly, you can always check in and make another comment because they'll get an email alerting them. Um, but that's the easiest way is, it's a collaborative process, so they have that flagged. So just make sure that you check your email that you have associated with your Drupal.org account. Okay, so Dreaditor is an extension I use um, in in the in the issue queue. Not everyone has this, so when we look at my issue queue, when I open it up, it might look a little different than yours. Dreaditor is an extension I use in Chrome. Um, and it adds some helpful buttons. Uh, you can see that there's an insert template button. Um, but now I noticed that that's already, that's in the infrastructure now. So what that does is it basically uh, inserts a summary, um, summary into the summary field. And it kind of reminds you of, of, of what to fill out. Um, this is my obligatory uh, science fiction reference. And let's talk a little bit about tooling and documentation. Um, you know, most of us use uh, Slack, but you know, there's Drupal ch Rocket Chat maybe in Europe. You know, some some people use Zulip, but Slack has really become that 
that main uh, user interface. And I like to, to tell folks that Slack is great, but if you're really collaborating on an issue, um, to keep most of your comments in the issue queue because other people who might not be privy to those Slack conversations can miss out on some of the context. Well, it's great to talk about the overview and who's working on things next. Uh, try to keep your chat in the issue queue. And then other useful tools, um, you know, if you're doing more of the code part, you know, having Drush installed, uh, making sure you have a version control system and, and um, uh, uh, get is the one that most uh, Drupal uses, but you know if you use WordPress, that's subversion. Composer is a dependency management uh, for PHP. You can have this installed globally or uh, locally based on the project. Um, text editor or IDE. Um, you know an IDE uh, can be kind of heavy for some folks. You can uh, stick with a basic bare bones uh, IDE, and it's really up to your personal preference. Uh, but as a new contributor or someone who doesn't do a lot of code, those IDE might uh, create a, a learning curve that you might not have time for. Simply test me, you know, um, I usually talk about this a little bit more. Uh, it, it is an alternative to having that local environment on your machine. Currently, right now, it's not working. Um, they're sprinting on it this weekend, so hopefully next week it'll be up and running again. But basically, it's an online service that provides that sandbox um, in your browser, and you can use it to evaluate projects. Um, you can see right here in the picture, there's uh, a drop down where you can pick the project name. So you can do Dr Drupal Core, and then you can select what version of Drupal Core you can add. Uh, modules in there, you know, say you want to test uh, display suite, that kind of thing. And what's great about Simply Test Me is you can share that URL with someone in the sandbox last 12 hours. So if I'm working on a project and I'm trying to figure something out, I can share that URL with a colleague across the country. We can both see what, what we're working on. And another use for Simply Test Me is um, in the issue queue, it will uh, spawn up a site that has all the information in the issue queue where it will attach the patch for you. Um, uh, Dreaditor is the thing that inserts those buttons and it really enhances the user experience and functionality of the issue queue. Um, but again, like, uh, like Simply Test Me, it's not always available, not always working. Um, and their status says cloudy with a chance of deprecation, but I do mention this because it is a tool that's handy for new contributors. And then I have some links, um, and if you uh, back scroll in the hop in chat, you can uh, look at the slides from Atlanta and you can access these links. So you know the solution of a problem, and um, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these because we're going to do a demo. Um, so. I don't want to say it's easy, but it is fairly straightforward. Um, and all of the steps are on a project page on how to do this, which makes it nice. But essentially, you know, you download the repository onto your local machine. Uh, you create a new branch to work on. You make a change between the original branch and the branch you've made the fixes on. And with that, you uh, compare and make a diff file, which is a patch. And then you upload the patch back to the issue you created or the issue that already exists and you write a comment. That's the solution process. Um, reviewing a patch. And you don't have to know code to test a patch um, and you don't have to know all of the things to test the patch. You can use Simply Test Me or you can, um, well, not today, but you can apply it locally in your Git repository and see if it applies. Um, you just want to make sure when you review some review something that you provide useful information, you know, if it threw any errors or if it didn't quite work as expected, you know, in your steps for reproduction. Um, sometimes it's handy if it's a if it's a UI thing um, or or an error to attach a screenshot to the issue so other people can see what's going on. And then after you test a patch, you want to make sure that you update the status. So if the status said it, it, it needed review, but the patch didn't work for you or there was something wrong, you would kick it back to needs review. Or if it passed, you would kick it to reviewed and tested by the community, which some people call RTBC. 
for short. And we talked about Dreadeter. Um, another thing that Dreadeter does um, when we're in the issue queue is it there's a review button and it pulls it up like a diff file. You can see that on the side here where you can see which lines have been added and which lines have been subtracted in this easy color code. Because sometimes as a new contributor, you look at that file without Dreadeter and it's just a white file, especially if it's a patch across multiple files with lots of pluses and minuses and it can be kind of hard to read. Um, another key thing that I like about the extension is when you click on a piece of code when you're reviewing it, it opens up a code comment box on the side. So you can type in um, your findings and hit save. And then when, then when you go back to the, to the issue, uh, your code comments have been injected into the next comment. So it's super handy. Okay, so now I'm time for the demo, but I'm gonna talk about it one more time. So, I've already found an issue to work on on a contributed project, but we're going to download the repository onto my machine. I'm going to create a new branch. I'm going to make changes. I'm going to compare the changes, and then I'm going to upload and write a comment. Okay. So we're going to find an issue. We're going to look at the file that needs help. We're going to download the repository. Oh, this is more the review process. Okay, so I am going to start the demo and that means I need to share my screen a little bit differently. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and I'm going to move me out of the way because you all don't wanna see my messy stuff. Um, Okay, so we have about 20 minutes, so I can be pretty in depth. Can someone tell me if they can see a Google window open on my, yes, okay. And then also just to test functionality, um, if I move my code, coder over there, do you folks see my, my text editor? Okay, cool. This is perfect. Okay, so I found a project that needed a couple of different things. So I'm going to navigate to the issue queue. It's the friendship project. Okay, here we go. So this is a project page on Drupal.org. It looks similar to the project page um, for the Drupal project itself. And I just want to look at, I might have a couple of extra window, uh, a couple of extra buttons that you folks might not see because um, I have a little bit of elevated privileges. So if you're not seeing exactly the same thing as me, um, don't think too much about it. And I'll paste this in the URL. This is what we're looking at, the friendship module. And on the project page, you can see the title. You can see a brief overview of what the project's about. Um, you know, we used to we used to think more about these security warnings and, you know, maybe not use projects because of the security warnings, but the security team, um, this is another thing where you can get back to Drupal is there, uh, there's a lot of these projects that are out there that just have not had time to be reviewed. So um, if you're into reviewing projects for security, it's a great way to get back to Drupal. So I don't mind that too much, but you can see, you know, what versions are available. Sometimes you'll see Drupal 7 version. On this side, you can see who the maintainers are. You can see that the last commit was about six months ago. I think that that's okay. That's not too old for this project. Um, you know, here's the issue queue. If I was to open this up, let's open it in a new window. You can see that there aren't a whole lot of issues open. So that's great. Um, there is an issue open. These two are pretty old, but that's okay. And then if you scroll down here, if there was any sort of doc, external documentation guide, it would there would be a link here that would take you to uh, uh, an external documentation page on Drupal.org. And that would be documentation that you could edit as well. You know, that isn't one of those one subject to the editorial process. But the real reason we came down here was to view the code repository, which is super handy. So you can view the code repository 
without having to download the project. And what we're going to work on today is the composer JSON file. Um, I know that this needs work because I ran this a little while ago, um, but I just want to open the file so you folks can see the file that we're going to work on. So this is a deprecated way of indicating what license is available. Um, you don't have to know this knowledge because we're just we're going to create a patch just so you can see the process, but I am going to share some documentation on this as well. So this is not the, the correct way of, of indicating what license is available. So what we're going to do is we're going to download the project and we're going to fix this JSON file. So if we go back to this uh, project page, there's a version control tab here. So I'm going to select that. And what's handy is it tells you how to set it up with get instructions. So right here. So if you were to work on like a different branch, you could pick the different branch and that would change the get instructions. But what this page is super handy is it tells you some basic things about how to create a patch, the naming process, uh, how to apply a patch. So if you ever forget, you can kind of use this page uh, for reference. Now, there's a caveat here on Drupal.org that you might find three different pieces of documentation on how to do the same thing. So just be mindful that there are a few different ways to do things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to snag this command. I'm going to open my terminal. Maybe. I'm going to bump it up a little bit so you folks can see. And I'm going to paste that command. Oops, not that one. This is a live demo, so you get to you know see uh, me kind of flail a little bit. But that's the beauty of live demos. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to CD into a folder where I keep my contributed modules. Um, just pick a place somewhere that you work on all your stuff. So I have a Drupal folder when I have a modules folder, and anything that I work on goes into that modules folder. So I, I'm taking that command, which is basically telling me, telling my computer to clone that branch onto my machine into that folder I specified, and then it's going to CD, change directories, into that friendship folder. So now if I do a PWD, which is present working directory, I can see that I'm in my Drupal modules friendship folder. Perfect. So I want to open that up in my text editor, and I have a command. Um, I call it a secret shortcut because this is like really great for me. Open space dot. And what that does is it opens it up in my finder window for me, which I think is super convenient. So then I'm just gonna drag this down into my text editor and it opens it in my text editor. So we were gonna look at the JSON file, which is here, but I wanna show you why, why we're gonna fix this file. If we go back to the, our terminal and we run a composer validate, oops, well, first you have to spell it right. Shoot. We'll get it right. Composer validate. It throws me an error. It tells me that my JSON file is valid, but if I visit this documentation, you can see that that line of code 2.0 plus is deprecated and to use a different line of code instead. Oh, thank you. That's a great command too. So I'm just going to copy and paste this and put it in my, my notes folder. Okay, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to fix that file so the next time when, we, when someone applies the patch, they're not going to get that error. So um, remember, we downloaded it onto our machine. We're looking at the code. Now we want to create a branch. Actually, back up. We're going to create an issue. So we go back to the issue queue, and I'm going to create a new issue right here. So I did some of this ahead of time to, to, for the sake of time. So we basically are saying what we're fixing, you know, the license code is deprecated, you know, so we're gonna pick a category that this is a task because it's not really a bug, it's still working. This is sort of a minor priority. 
status. We're not really doing anything with this, so we're going to leave it active. We're going to suggest that this goes into the dev version um, because it's not a bug on any specific version. So if, if that's the case or a feature request, um, I always put it into that dev version. In the component, it's code. And I am going to assign this to myself because I am actively working on this issue in the next five minutes, and I know I'm going to work on it. Um, I'm going to tag this novice, and you can see I'm going to let it auto-populate and pick my own tag. Here's that template I told you about in the summary queue. You know, sometimes if you don't see this, make sure, you know, you have all these fields open. Um, I don't always use this because it's not a big bug. So you know, when I ran the composer command in the terminal, I got the following error. And I copied and pasted this from before. So I'm going to highlight that in code. And then I'm going to have some steps to reproduce for the next person. You know, run composer update in the terminal terminal, and you should receive above error message. I'm also going to say I assigned this to myself because I am actively working on it. Um, there's no parent issue. Say if this was like a meta issue and you're working on a child issue, you could you could assign it, you know, related issues, anything like that. But I'm just going to kind of go through this one more time to make sure. I have a short, concise title. I've indicated the priority. You know, I've selected the version. I've assigned it to myself. My comment looks pretty good. So I'm going to hit Save. And what this does is it creates a unique node on Drupal.org. And why this is important is because we're going to grab this unique node number and put it in our notes. There's a couple of things we do with this unique node member. I'm going to add a dash to. So we've downloaded it on our machine. We've created a unique node on Drupal.org. So now what we want to do is we want to create a branch. So if we go back to the terminal, I'm going to do PWD just to make sure I'm in the same place. I am. So I'm going to do a get branch checkout. And I named my branches um, the unique node number. And um, the naming convention for patches, and I'll go through this as we, as we write the patch, is um, I don't think it's on here. OK, so creating a patch. Um, the, the, the naming convention is a short suite uh, description, the issue number, and the comment number. So it's easier for me to track in my folders when my branch numbers match my patch numbers. So if I have to go back later. So that's why I'm picking that as the, as the branch name. So we did a get checkout, and we're going to do a get dash B for a new branch, and it's going to switch us. So get checkout dash B. And that didn't work, so let's see. <clears throat> this is why live demos are great and folks get to see me work through. I don't do this every day, you can tell, and that's okay. Did I spell something wrong? Oh, okay. It helps if I had all the stuff, right? Get checkout. Okay, so get checkout dash B. So um uh oh. Okay, 
there we go. I'm not sure why that didn't work. So we did get checkout dash B and I named the branch the unique node number and the comment number. So now we're switched to that new branch. So when we open the code editor, um, let's bump this up so you folks can see. We want to change that one line of code. Um, and if we went to that documentation page that the air spit out for us, you'll find documentation that corroborates that we want to use the new naming convention of 2.0 later. So if we go back to our code editor, select that piece of code, change it. So I'm going to save my file. So now when I go back to my terminal, if I do a get status, we can see that I modified that one line, that one file. So we're going to uh, add it. We're going to commit it. And this commit message, no one else will ever see, but to, you know, just use your best practices and um, uh, use it how you would write uh, a commit message for a ticket you're working on for work. Um, Composer issues. So now when I do a get status, my working tree is clean. So now that I've, you know, created a branch, um, made the changes and committed the changes, I want a difference between that first branch I committed or the first branch I pulled down and the new branch. So what I want to do is create a diff file. I just realized I'm um, not showing you folks what I'm working on, so let me move that. Okay, so I'm creating a diff file. Um, comparing the two branches. And I need to know the, the name of the original branch. So if I go to my terminal and do get branch, uh, you can see the branch I'm on along with uh, that we first downloaded. So I'm going to create a diff file, a get diff between that first branch, 8.1, um, and then my branch, which we named the name of the module and uh, the 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 comment number. And so if we go back to that project page, you can see that they really want it to be a description, the issue number, and the comment number. So instead of the issue number, what I want to do is I'm just going to put the name of the project on there. Um, and then the issue number. Uh, this is a composer. Okay, so now I'm going to snag that command, go back to my terminal, so I'm get diffing and making it into a patch. So now if I go into my text editor, there's a new file in there with my patch. So I'm gonna review this patch. Okay, here's a couple of lines and you can see that there's one line of code changed. So now I have this patch, perfect. Go back to your issue look at all the things, make sure that they're up to date. And now I'm gonna ask someone to review this. 
So I'm going to make a useful comment saying, you know, uploaded patch for review. But because this is a novice issue and I am not a novice, I'm going to make some clarifications for, for folks. I'm going to add some steps to validate. I'm going to tell people that they can apply the patch. They run Composer update in the terminal. And then after running Composer validate, you should see the following um, message that it should be valid. But also I'm tagging a couple of these things because I'm using this issue as an example in a presentation for contrib day because I'm not a novice and I shouldn't really be working on this. And then I mark this issue as novice because I want to save this for review for a novice person. You know, that just helps helps people learn. And sometimes making those, those comments help people kind of stay away from those and save those. I'm going to unassign myself because I'm done working on this. I'm going to come down to the files. I'm going to choose my file, which remember for me is in my Drupal folder, modules, friendship, and then there's my patch. And you can see there's my patch. And I'm going to open it. I'm going to upload it. And I'm going to save. So what this does is it alerts people now that it needs review. So if you go into the into the into the main issue queue for all of Drupal, you know, they're color coded, which makes it nice. So you can see that this is in need of review. Um, so the next step, and we're kind of out of time, um, would be to, uh, you know, review the patch. So those Dreditor buttons are in here. So I can click on this and I can see, oh, okay, those are the two lines of code that have changed. If I wanted to, you know, if something was wrong, I'd click on this and I'd make a comment. I'm just doing this for example. Make a comment, hit save, hit paste. And what that did, it, it injected that line comment into the comment box for me. And say, I'm just going to kind of pretend to do this. If I found that this was okay, I would mark it, you know, reviewed and tested by the community and hit save. If I didn't like the way it was, I would hit needs review. Um, you know, if I uploaded a different patch, if I don't have that answer to it, but it definitely needs work. I would switch it to needs work. And then when you make these comments, make sure they're useful for the next person. You know, make sure you, you tell everyone what steps you did to replicate um, those issues and then um, um, any screenshots, like I said. So I know I'm out of time and closing remarks are on, but I wanna thank everyone for coming. And I also wanna say that um, Drupal Europe is coming up and there's going to be contribution day at Drupal Europe. Uh, Drupal New York City is next weekend and there's a contribution day on December 14th at Drupal Camp New York City. And I, if you want more help or another demo or you want to go through this review process, please reach out to me. I'm Volkswagen Chick on all the medias and I'm more than happy to walk someone through the process of the review or even, you know, the patch or creating anything. So. Um, uh, I'm just, I just want to make sure everyone knows that I'm available after this. And thank you.